And uh, again, this is uh, titled Optical Wave Management Fundamentals. And uh, so it's going to start off with some very basic information and we'll uh, slowly progress into uh, more technical details as we uh, wrap up the uh, final slides. So without further ado, I'm going to just review quickly the uh, agenda for today. Uh, I'm going to start with a quick uh, introduction um, and talk about the wavelength theory and uh, follow that up with the uh, fiber handling guidelines, which is, of course, very important for uh, accurate measurements using a fiber into your instrument. Um, we're going to talk about wavelength measurement techniques, various different types, and the review of few sample applications, and uh, also discuss the uh, top 10 OSA, or optical spectrum analyzer considerations, kind of like a checklist for everybody. So um, just a quick background on Yokogawa. Uh, we were uh, founded in 19 15, so uh, we celebrated our 100-year uh, anniversary um, two years ago now. It's 2017. Um, so our first products that were introduced by Yokogawa were actually electric voltmeters. And here's a picture of an old voltmeter from the 1930s. Um, so the point is that uh, we've been focused on test equipment since the inception of the company, which is over 100 years now. Uh, we have over 18,000 employees worldwide. And it was grown to over $4 billion of uh, revenue over the years. Um, uh, we have global operations in over 50 countries. And probably the most significant uh, bullet item at this, for this uh, presentation is the fact that we acquired uh, Ando Electric in uh, 2004. And uh, some of you may have heard that brand. It's a very well-known brand, the leader in optical test equipment and innovation. And, uh, Here's a picture of an uh, older Ando AQ6317B optical spectrum analyzers that are still actually in use today in many labs and universities. So the next uh, item I wanted to cover is uh, corporate background as far as uh, our different offices. Uh, our Customization headquarters is located in Atlanta, outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we do have offices in Canada, Mexico, as well as uh, Houston area, which is uh, huge for our big uh, oil and gas industry and industrial automation um, department. And a very quick overview of the products that we make. Um, uh, most people know us uh, as, have, as having the most popular product line being the optical spectrum analyzer. So um, that's good and bad. That's great uh, to have that great reputation. But uh, we do offer other products as well um, that's related to optical wavelength measurements as well as other uh, testing, modular test platforms, and uh, ins installation and maintenance products as well. So um, the two uh, items uh, this we'll discuss further today would be the, the OSA and the optical wavelength meters because they're related to this uh, optical wavelength measurement topic. Um, so let's jump into uh, wavelength theory, a little background on that. So uh, going, stepping way back as the very beginning of time, you know, uh, you can look at a human being as an actual wavelength measurement tool. Because in reality, you know, we see colors. Everybody can see a color uh, with the eyeball. Uh, so that could be considered, if you uh, relate that to a measurement instrument tool, that could be considered a light sensor or detector. Okay. Um, we have optic nerves, our uh, connections to the CPU, which being our brain as a central processing unit. And we also have uh, memory storage. Uh, I know that's uh, degrading for myself uh, over the years, but uh, still have some left. and. Um, the lastly, we have, you know, instruments to handwrite or record or just uh, report back the uh, uh, colors that we're seeing. So uh, on the right-hand side, you see a uh, early spectrometer uh, with an eyepiece, and that's the way uh, in the very early times people used uh, this instrument using their eye sight to see the color spectrum of different uh, devices. Or in those days, it was probably mostly like a different stars and for astronomy purposes and things like that. So the next item is uh, 
going back to the very early question that uh, a lot of us have asked as a child is, uh, why is this sky blue? You know, this is something that uh, I know my, my kids have asked me before. Uh, it's a very common question, but it's, uh, you know, of course, directly related to uh, our topic here in a very uh, general level. Um, the basic reasoning is the sunlight reaches Earth's atmosphere and is scattered in all different directions. That's actually called Rayleigh scattering um, by different particles in the air. So it could be CO2 and nitrogen, and you know, we can talk, we'll talk later about how some of our instruments could be used to detect those uh, different gases. Um, the blue light is scattered in all different directions into that, uh, in the Earth's atmosphere more than the uh, other colors because it has a shorter wavelength, as you can see in the chart on the right there. So as a visible light spectrum, we have those different colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, blue, is going to have a shorter wavelength. So uh, it's going to scatter that light, and that's why we're seeing a blue sky when we look up. But uh, we do sometimes we'll see a uh, orange or reddish glow when the sun's setting, and that's because the light's traveling a longer distance uh, shown in the picture on the bottom, and you have more of the atmosphere to scatter the light in a different, or sort of like a filtering uh, or reflection effect. So you see a red color, so you see the longer uh, wavelength. So in general, the light travels, the physics behind it is the light travels in a straight line, and you know, something gets in the way and does one of these things. It could either be reflected, like a mirror, it could be bent, like a prism and to like a rainbow pattern. We'll talk a lot more about that in the next few slides. Oh, and it could scatter it, uh, just like I mentioned with the molecules and the gases in the atmosphere. So this is like a Raleigh scattering effect. Um, going way back to uh, many of you have seen this uh, electromagnetic spectrum uh, from uh, physics courses. Uh, so this is just uh, summarizing the different electromagnetic and uh, light wave patterns from different uh, properties of light, uh, from gamma rays, x-rays, uh, ultraviolet, uh, infrared, or visible and infrared microwave. Then we get into the FM radio waves, so, which are uh, really considered you know, radio waves from, from there on. So the main focus that we're talking about, going to be talking about is mostly visible and some of the near and mid IR region. So keep in mind that the wavelength is expressed in lambda in the units of measure of using the distance, you know, meters or nanometers. And the frequency, the reciprocal of that, that's uh, described in hertz, megahertz, terahertz, and that stuff. And so that's why the two numbers are uh, the reciprocals of each other. So one will be increased, the other parameter will be decreasing. Okay. And uh, to help everyone, um, kind of plan out you know, what type of instruments would be uh, useful for measuring the device that they have. We have a light map wall poster, and you can contact us uh, either at the webinar or at this uh, web address to request a free copy. Um, kind of handy for uh, putting on your wall in the lab, especially universities, a handy reference source to show you the different types of uh, wavelengths and applications for the light sources that are on the market and something that you may be uh, testing in the future. And uh, going to more specific wavelengths, uh, we want to talk about the typical telecom wavelengths uh, that a lot of our instruments are uh, being used for. So starting at the lower spectrum, we have 850 nanometer. That's a very popular wavelength for multimodal transceivers. And then we have a different band that would be for single mode transmission, which uh, is governed by the ITU uh, organization for WDM transmissions. And I'll talk more about what WDM is and how that works in the next few slides. So that's segregated into multiple bands that are denoted by the uh, different letters. The most popular one is uh, would be considered a C band for single mode application, uh, applications, section 1530 to 1565. 1550 is usually the most common wavelength for traditional single mode transmission applications. So um, before anything else, I do want to cover uh, some basic fiber handling techniques, and that's 
well, it's very important when uh, you're testing, especially communication signals that are on uh, very delicate fiber optic uh, cables and connections. So before uh, anything else, we always recommend that uh, you remember to clean the connector ends. Uh, there's different types of uh, tools available uh, to inspect that if you're really uncertain about it. Um, this is an example of one that's uh, connected to one of our a portable instrument for field use where basically it's a probe that magnifies the tip of the fiber and uh, uh, this is showing the different images that it could produce uh, based on different conditions uh, whether it's dusty or oil covered or scratched um, so it's very handy for figuring out your connector before you connect it to your instrument to make sure that your readings are accurate. Um, it is uh, Surprise to some people that have not worked with optics where you can just touch the tip of the finger on the fiber and uh, it would basically change it to uh, uh, look something like this oil covered uh, image here uh, very quickly and very easily. So, why is this important? As I mentioned, you know, it could cause false readings, easily be transferred to a mating connector or test equipment. So, that's another point too is if your connector is dirty, and instrument connector is clean, but if you connect it to your instrument, you could introduce that contamination to your instrument, which could be uh, uh, very troublesome to clean that instrument. Um, as far as fiber uh, cables, there's always uh, usually connections on the end, different types of connectors. There's a whole host of different connectors on the market, but the, the two that we use uh, most commonly are the F which is uh, sometimes known as Frank Charlie. Um, that's about, you know, about, I would say about 90% of the people in the lab use this type of connector, and that's because it's very reliable. It's got a metal barrel that you can thread it on to your instrument. Um, another very popular one is uh, Sam Charlie's or SD connectors, and again, that's very popular for field use because it's very easy to click on and off instead of plastic housing. It just, you don't have to thread the uh, connector. There's other connectors we can get STs, LCs, and multi-ribbon fibers. Um, there's also different types of uh, connector polishes that determine different back reflections. So we have um, a very common one is the flat uh, FCPC and SCPC connection. And we have angled uh, FCAPC that gives you better back reflection property. So and that's denoted usually by a green, either green connector or green boot on the end of the table. Um, so this is a picture of uh, a flat to flat connector connection and an angle to angle connector tip. So uh, why is this important to know? Um, because if you connect an angled connector to a flat connector, you may potentially damage the mating connector just because of the physical mismatch so it could be, again, disastrous if that connector is inside your test instrument and you have to send it back to, uh, to the factory to get it repaired or replaced. Um, different uh, types of fibers I want to cover is uh, there's a single mode, which is very typically used in telecommunication signals, usually have a 9 micron core size. And then they have a yellow jacket. Uh, that uh, helps you identify those. Uh, Multi-mode fiber is for communications and uh, a lot of other applications is usually core size is uh, quite a bit bigger than a single mode. The core size is uh, 50 micron or 62 and a half micron. Um, what I'm showing here is the, the, the numbers represent, the first number is the core size in the middle and the second number is the uh, uh, cladding size. So those, those are the two numbers that's being usually representing the different type of uh, sizes of fibers. Um, most, uh, a lot of multiple cables, at least in the U.S., have an orange jacket to help people identify those. And the reason why, uh, and there's other large core size, larger core size available too, such as for visible light, you know, 100, 200, 800 micron, or even larger when you go into plastic optical fibers. Um, so why is this important? Because if you have the wrong fiber type to device in the test, test equipment will almost always provide false readings. And I have some examples to, to clarify that further as 
well. So I um, want to also start now covering the different wavelength measurement techniques. Um, going to discuss uh, different types of instruments or uh, technologies out there. You know, there's, you know, probably a lot more than what I'm listing, but these are some of the commonly uh, uh, used ones in the industry, which is uh, spectrometers, spectrophotometers, uh, optical spectrum analyzers, and optical wavelength readers. And they all use a little bit different technology internally. So first to cover the spectrometers and spectrophotometers, uh, this is a diagram showing an example of what a spectrometer looks like inside. So a very basic definition from a, a Webster de a dictionary is you know, an instrument used for measuring wavelengths of light spectra. Uh, any of various instruments in which an emission uh, is dispersed according to some property. Okay. So basically the light enters in, the light that you want to measure enters in through a slit or the input and it goes through uh, some type of uh, collimating mirror sometimes, goes through a, a passes through a grating, transmission grating, or sometimes a prism. Uh, that may go directly into the sensor or may get uh, reflected off the focusing mirror, depending on the, the design of the spectrometer, into an image sensor. Sometimes this is like a CCD array in many cases. So the sensor, there's actually multiple sensors here because the light is getting spread into the, the colors of the light is getting spread into different positions. So those sensors will pick that up and determine the, uh, the spectra of the light source that's coming in. Uh, spectrometers, um, the key thing to remember is it measures how much light is being emitted by a, a sample. So uh, some simple applications is for, uh, here's this picture of a portable Ramon uh, spectrometer for chemical or lab use uh, for sampling uh, chemicals in the lab, for example. Um, another one that's used uh, is for color analysis, for printing applications. Okay, so um, it's a pretty much a very different variety of applications. Uh, this is a verification of what a spectral photometer is. So next, this is the next thing I want to cover. Some people will hear those two terms, and they sound kind of similar, but the, the main difference is a spectrophotometer measures how much light is being absorbed by a sample instead of being emitted. So it really consists of a sort of like a spectrometer, the, uh, the components for a spectrometer, where there's a light source going into a, a prism or grating that gets spread out and selected by a wavelength selector slit, but that uh, from there, it goes into a sample solution. A lot of times it's uh, a uh, cuvette that's used to basically put different, let's say, color dyes or, or liquids, and it measures the light that's passing through the sample, and depending on the properties of the sample, it absorbs the light in different patterns. So this is an example result of a uh, sample of uh, an acid and a base uh, solution where you can see the different absorbance properties using a spectrophotometer. Usually it's integrated into one device. You put your sample in the instrument and here's a picture of a uh, spectrophotometer where you can use it to analyze different red samples. Uh, next thing is the uh, rotating grading monochromator technology. And this is something that uh, we're very familiar with. Uh, we're using this in our optical spectrum an analyzers. So uh, what is an OSA? Just a high-level view of that is an, an OSA measures distribution of optical power over wavelength. So um, you have your wavelength in the X scale and your optical power in the Y scale. And that's a lot of times measured in units of like EBM or milliwatts, okay. the log or linear scale. And as I mentioned earlier, the wavelength uh, could be also measured in frequency as well. Those are two different parameters that we offer nanometers or terahertz. Um, so explaining a little further on uh, how monochromator works is the word itself, uh, the attorney term of monochromator actually consists of the word mono, implying it's single, and chromate is color in Greek. So basically it means it's collected selecting a single color. And uh, the theory here is you have your light, your input light coming in that you want to measure, goes into a re 
reflecting mirror into a rotating grating in this case. As the grating rotates, it bounces off another mirror and goes into a output slit that selects the one color while it's being rotated. So the, again, the grating reflects the light into a rainbow spectrum and the rotating action selects the single color to pass through the slit. So a closer look at that grating, uh, many of you have uh, actually noticed uh, a DVD uh, or DVD acts like a grating because if you look at it a certain way under a certain light, you will see like a rainbow reflection off of it. And that's kind of the same principles behind a, a diffraction grating. So where a white light source comes in and gets uh, reflected, uh, diffracted actually, in this uh, manner as a rainbow pattern. And if you put a uh, output slit, you could select uh, and detect the color of the light that's passing through the slit from the rainbow pattern. And here's an animation showing that. And uh, what's going to happen is that this rotating grating is going to rotate. And you'll see the different colors of the rainbow bone passing through the slit and going into a uh, uh, photo detector um, that goes through an amplifier circuitry, through a, an A to D analog to digital process, and gets display on the optical spectrum analyzer screen. So I'm going to start this animation. And you should see that screen uh, rotate, or that the uh, uh, grading rotate. So I'll run it one, one more time. And depending on your connection, you may have a different speed as pivoting at. But the, so note the uh, uh, OSA display uh, will follow basic that basic uh, rotational movement to display your wavelength. So that's uh, basically how OSA works, showing your sweep of your spectrum. Uh, next item I want to talk about is the interferometers. So that's a very different technology that's usually used in a more precise instrument known as an optical wavelength meter. So an um, optical wavelength meter measures uh, same parameters, wavelength and power, but uh, in this case, it measures the peak wavelengths of an optical signal with a very, very extreme precise uh, measurements. Uh, it's often in picometer or sub-picometer accuracy in the specs. Um, use uh, inside an optical wavelength meter is uh, typically a Nicholson interferometer coupled with a FFT algorithm and it allows a measurement of modulated or non-modulated signals from samples such as optical transceivers. Um, and uh, it will display that uh, in a uh, front panel display sometimes as a multi-wavelength, like as shown here, or sometimes as a single wavelength. You just get one number if you just want to know the peak of one signal. So it depends really on your signal that you're measuring with it. Um, Discussing a little bit more about how a uh, Michelson interferometer works is it utilizes a internal reference light source. So this light source is a very stable helium neon light source at uh, I think 630 something nanometer. So it's a very stable source that's used as the reference source. And you would put in uh, your light from the device that you're testing. That light travels through a beam splitter. That beam splitter will split the light into two different paths. And the light gets bounced off, uh, in this case, a fixed mirror, and then it goes through and gets bounced off a movable mirror. So both of these lights, the reference light source and the input light source that you're measuring, are getting passed through this mechanism with a moving mirror. So the principle here is when your mirror's moving, you're changing the light path of those two signals. We know the signal on the reference source is fixed. So that's our known entity. And the unknown entity is the signal we're trying to measure. So if we take those two signals and look at the interference pattern using the two different detectors, 
we will see uh, a difference in time because the difference because the mirror is moving. So you do see a difference in the time domain. What we do is after that, it goes through uh, an FFT algorithm and goes through, uh, uh, gets processed and converted into wavelength. So we're converting the uh, time scale to a uh, frequency or wavelength scale through the uh, fast Fourier transform algorithm that's built into the unit. So typically these are very fast and makes one measurement within a fraction of a second. And um, a very uh, ideally used for very precise optical uh, peak wavelength measurement. So I just put this together just to compare the two since they are both used to measure wavelength versus power. And here's a comparison of a monochromator design, which is uh, used in our optical spectrum analyzers, and interferometer design, which is used in our wavelength readers. So the key difference to note here is that the uh, monochromator or OSA has uh, better resolution and is variable, is being fixed. And dynamic range is considerably higher um, because you can measure much deeper into your trace or your spectrum. So um, when we're talking 80 dB compared to 35 dB. Uh, accuracy levels are pretty similar, but the other thing to notice is that the uh, level sensitivity is also much higher on an OSA. So the key thing to notice the the main advantage of the interferometer or wavelength meter is wavelength accuracy. So again, we're talking about sub picometer accuracy on a wavelength meter versus about 10 picometer accuracy on a OSA. Okay. Um, so I want to talk about some sample applications that uh, some of our customers uh, have used our instruments for. Um, so it's actually pretty widespread. Um, we we'll always get something new uh, when we talk to customers about how they're using instruments. So in the very general sense, um, it's uh, for visible wavelength light. Uh, a lot of people are using it to test their uh, diode pumps, solid, solid state lasers, um, different laser diodes. So that's on a component level. Um, they can measure uh, super continuum light sources because that's one of the visible lights, one of the um, wavelengths that this super continuum source generates. Uh, FPGs, fiber bag gratings, uh, fluorescence filters, I'll talk more about that. Um, so the industries that you know, these devices cover is actually you know, very broad, um, covers you know, medical, bio-optics, uh, industrial applications for laser welding, laser trimming, laser marking, and uh, telecom applications where some people are using um, visible light for plastic optical fiber. Um, uh, we hear that, like, uh, actually in the automobiles, uh, they're using uh, uh, fiber more and more for the entertainment system. So that's being very pop becoming very popular now. Um, that's also used for LIDAR, for range-finding applications, um, home electronics. Uh, I'll talk more about that in the next few slides. Um, so here's a, a more for, like, a commercial or uh, consumer product application where uh, if you have a micro projector, um, you would need to test the uh, visible wavelength of the uh, lasers that's being used in the micro projector. Usually, it's a there's like a green diodes or uh, you know red, green, blue uh, diodes are usually used for uh, micro projectors. Um, and uh, even you know some of these are now being more on portable devices. You know sometimes um, there's you know, talk about having a micro projector built into uh, the portable uh, handheld phone, for example, where you can just project it. And of course, we are already seeing portable portable projectors. Um, that's just about the size of the uh, uh, mobile phone now that you can just carry along with you. So, uh, another application for visible light is in the bio optics industry for cell fluorescence uh, uh, measurements. Um, this could include, as I mentioned, the uh, dial pump solid state lasers, um, different fluorescence filters, uh, how you can use it to test the uh, filter uh, properties of the uh, fluorescence spectrum, as you can see in this slide, in this uh, output here. Um, so this is the output of a 
a wavelength versus power from the OSA, showing the different transmission spectrum of the filters and the fluorescent spectrum of uh, different samples. Um, another very popular application uh, for our OSAs and wavelength meters is for telecommunications applications. Um, popular method for that is the wavelength division multiplexing. And the way that works is um, the whole idea is if we want to reduce the number of fibers that's being used or deployed in the field, because that gets expensive when you're deploying fibers across the, the uh, city, the, the state, the nation, even globally, you know, transatlantic, uh, trans-Pacific uh, deployments. So the idea is to increase the number of channels on a single fiber. And uh, the way that's done is you have multiple channels on the different wavelengths that's being fed into a MUX. That MUX combines those signals into one fiber, and that fiber gets transmitted through a long distance, and that gets attenuated sometimes, and it needs to be amplified. When it's amplified, you do end up getting some noise from the, app, for the, from the app, uh, amplification process. Uh, sometimes it'll get uh, transmitted through a rotom or uh, ad drop uh, module, okay? uh, reconfigure or optical ad drop module to uh, add and drop channels to different parts of the uh, network to from one city to another. Okay, so you're uh, adding and dropping channels on this uh, fiber link, and after that you may get a combination of different signals that look differently, some with noise, some with more noise than others, and then eventually it gets the the multiplex the mux into uh, the ind individual channels when it reaches the destination. So as you can see, um, an optical spectrum analyzer or the measurement of the wavelength is very important in all, pretty much all aspects of this transmission link or transmission network. Okay. So. And this is just an example of what uh, OS, uh, what our OSA WDM analysis uh, feature looks like. Um, it's actually very easy to use. Uh, the idea is that you would just press this uh, one button and it will automatically uh, apply this algorithm to measure the multi-channel signal, tell you where all the peak wavelengths are, uh, tell you where the noise level are, figure out the signal to noise ratio and all that in real time. And uh, it's one of our most popular uh, applications for our OSAs. Or built-in analysis routines for OSAs. Um, another application that's not telecom related at all is for uh, gas sensing. Um, this could be used for analyzing different gases in the atmosphere. So the theory is that if you have a light source and you shine that light source, like in this case the picture showing the sun going into a column with some gas, and that column of gas is absorbing the light with different signatures or in different patterns. So if you look at the display, the absorption spectrum from this type of gas, you can see that there's various notches in this. And from those notches, you can compare that to known gases and help determine what type of gases are uh, uh, actually being tested. So in this case, it's testing methane gas, but it's also popularly used for like CO2 for environmental gas uh, studies. Um, so another very popular and non-telecom based application for OSAs. Um, next, moving forward, uh, I want to talk about, just share with you uh, a top 10 checklist that we put together uh, for people that are considering uh, an OSA. Um, so the key parameters in terms of the performance aspect are uh, wavelength range, the resolution, and accuracy, level sensitivity, ability to measure weak signals, uh, dynamic range, and of course sweep speed for a lot of people that have a lot of uh, different uh, channels to test and they want to get the job done quicker, of course, uh, and the cost. Uh, the unit, of course, is very important, and the value of the unit is also very important that I'll uh, discuss as well. 
Um, as far as the additional considerations, that's not related to performance sometimes is the optical interface is also very important and operational interface makes it much more user friendly. And uh, lastly, the long-term reliability and support of the product and the companies, of course, very important. You have a uh, conservative investment in the instrument, you want to make sure that it's going to last a long time, it's going to be supported uh, in a very long time. So in terms of the wavelength range, um, we have, uh, we're showing here a uh, model lineup of the different spectrum analyzers that uh, we offer. Um, so this is, uh, doesn't matter um, which one you're looking at, of course, that's usually the first thing you should determine is based on the wavelength that you need, uh, you would uh, select the appropriate model. Um, and again, this is a uh, light map poster I mentioned earlier that's available, uh, no charge if you uh, request it from us, that has the different types of light sources at different wavelengths just for your reference. So you can kind of quickly glance at it and determine, okay, I'm testing the pixels and I'm testing uh, optical transmission signals and you can tell what type, which model of OSA is appropriate for that application. Um, so there's, uh, I realize there is a number of overlapping uh, models. So we do have a very handy selection guide in, on the website that will help you determine the more detailed specs of each of these models to determine the most appropriate model for you. Next thing is, uh, that's also very important is uh, wavelength resolution. So the wavelength resolution is defined as the uh, full with half max, half max of a line spectrum. And uh, in our case of OSA, it's, it's governed by the width of the slit opening that I mentioned earlier, explaining the technology where you have a slit that selects the color of the light that's getting detected. So the narrower slit width equates to a smaller resolution value and a wider slit width equates to a greater resolution value. So that's important to consider uh, for your application. Um, another important consideration is the uh, waving accuracy. And of course, uh, that's also important to meet your specifications of your design. Um, in our case, we have a, a built-in calibration light source inside the instrument to help ensure the uh, accuracy of the instrument. Very easy to, to perform, just connect the fibers between your output, uh, the internal output of the, uh, the calibration source into the input of the uh, uh, OSA, and you press two buttons and it will automatically execute a uh, alignment process and a wavelength calibration process. We recommend doing this uh, on a routine basis or especially when you've moved the instrument or you know, it's been uh, subject to some shock or some uh, temperature change that's you know, abnormal temperature changes. Um, what's happening when you're doing this wavelength uh, uh, calibration routine or the internal cal routine? So internally, we have a broadband LED light source that's passing through an acetylene gas cell and it comes out with the output port. So you may recall I mentioned that one of the applications is for gas detection. So this is actually a, a, a similar, very uh, similar application where it's actually actually utilizing the acetylene gas absorption spectrum to help the OSA determine a very specific cow point uh, or notch that's coming out of the acetylene gas. And in this case, we're using a cow point notch at the 1530.3714 nanometers, and that's because it's close to a telecommunication signal in one of our models that's uh, commonly used to basically align a, or shift or, or offset the internal PAL table uh, that's built into the OSA. So um, that's a very handy way for people to ensure the accuracy of our instruments built in. Um, another thing that's important is to consider is the sensitivity. So if you have a very low level signal, especially when you're measuring uh, OSNR, OSNR, for example, you have some low level noise, you want to make sure that's measured accurately to determine a uh, accurate OSNR reading. That's the signal to noise ratio. So you need to measure the noise accurately to get a precise reading. So uh, in our case, the uh, OSAs can actually measure down to minus 90 dBm. So that's a very, very a high sensitivity setting, um, but we do have settings uh, available for 
users to select a lower sensitivity if they don't have a very weak signal and they want to optimize the speed. So there's a trade-off between the sensitivity setting and the sweep speed. So the higher the sensitivity, it would need more time to perform the sweep. And the next parameter to consider is a dynamic range. So why should you care about dynamic range? Because it's important to see the true shape of an optical spectrum. So here's an example of an optical spectrum from your the actual spectrum from your device. And if you do a sweep with a spectrum analyzer, depending on the dynamic range specification, you would measure a narrower and narrower band that's closer and closer to the actual spectrum of your signal. So this is important in some cases where you have two signals that may be close together. And the idea here is that you want to have good close and dynamic range performance because if you don't, you could mistakenly not see this deep valley between these two signals. It would show a much shallower valley, so, so you would want to be able to see as deep as possible if you have signals that are close together. So that's what we call a close and dynamic range specification. Um, another uh, important parameter, number six, is sweep speed. Of course, we don't all, nobody likes to sit there and watch the, the instrument sweep and wait for a long time to get the result. So a um, number of years ago when we in, introduced our current generation OSA, we introduced a, sweep, a seamless sweep feature. And we uh, made some uh, significant improvements to the gain control circuitry as well as the algorithm to be able to de uh, make the sweep much faster. So on older generation OSAs that are currently still out there, you may see a pause like this in this animation where when it's doing the sweep, it does a little pause. And that's because it's doing a gain change. So when you have a signal that's uh, going up and down, the sensitivity will change and the gain will change in the uh, um, detector circuit and it will have this little pause. Whereas on the newer generation models, we have basically made it seamless. So you're basically not even noticing when the unit pauses to make that gain change. And another very, uh, also the difference between the two is actually 10 times faster sweep speed between the uh, older generation unit with, uh, without the seamless sweep feature. Um, another very significant uh, breakthrough that we've uh, offered uh, for the past few years is a double sweep speed mode. And that's unique to the Yokogawa OSAs. Um, the way that works is we can change the uh, integration uh, uh, algorithm in the uh, processing uh, unit of the OSA, and we're able to effectively double the sweep speed when you're using a high resolution, high sensitivity setting. So remember, higher sensitivity setting, the slower the sweep is. So it's especially important when you're having using a high sensitivity setting. Uh, you want you don't want to wait for your sweep. Uh, you want to be able to finish that as quickly as possible. So we've offered this double sweep speed feature uh, pretty much on all our OSA models now. So very handy feature um, for people that are trying to get their work done quickly. Um, next item is the cost and value. So uh, the key point I want to make is, you know, you want to measure the true cost versus the performance factors. So, uh, you know, we are one of the leaders in the, uh, I would say, you know, I, I, I say we're like the, the target leader in the uh, telecom OSA industry. And there's uh, competitors that uh, are using us as a bullseye or, or to target their specifications after. But it's not easier said than done. Um, so what ends up happening is uh, they take shortcuts to create a, a low performance product, but they're using creative specmanship to create a false impression of the equivalent performance. So buyer beware, um, just want to share that. Uh, an, an example here is uh, one of the competitors is uh, specifying the same minus 90 dB in sensitivity spec. If you look closely at the fine print of the footnote, it says that you have to add perform a 10 times averaging to achieve this minus 90 dBm spec. Uh, if you don't, it's more like 
minus 85 dBm. So a whole 5 dBm difference between the two with and without averaging. And if you do do the averaging 10 times, it could take you up to 40 times longer to achieve that minus 90 dBm uh, spec. So you don't want to learn that after the fact when you have to measure a, a high sensitivity signal uh, that the unit is actually 40 times slower uh, as a result. Um, so we do have, uh, that's just one example, and we do have tools and detailed comparison info to help uh, people make that decision. Um, basically, uh, another example would be the sweep speed. You, know, you compare the sweep speed with two different models, and it could be the same on paper, 0.2 seconds, 0.2 seconds. And that's in the normal sensitivity mode, but when you start increasing the sensitivity, it could be significantly different and slower in this case for the competitor. Um, another important consideration is the optical interface. So you may recall uh, items I talked about earlier when we are working with fibers is cleaning the fibers is extremely important. Make sure that the end tip of the fiber is clean. Um, making sure your correct type of fiber is important. You don't want to have the wrong fiber type in the instrument to give you a false reading. And then you want you don't want to risk the uh, damaging your input uh, fiber on the instrument, especially by connecting the wrong uh, flat polished connector to an angle polished connector. So just a physical mismatch there. So why am I bringing this up? Because um, the key thing to consider here is a novel and very unique design that we offer is considered a free space input. So uh, this is actually an animation that we produce that's on the web or on YouTube where we're emphasizing the fact that most instruments have a fiber on the inside. So this is like a cutaway view of a typical instrument. You have a fiber coming in and a fiber inside instrument. Whereas in our case, we actually have no internal input fiber. It's actually free space and it, the beam goes right into the instrument. So the advantages there is addresses all those uh, issues that we talked about earlier with the fiber op, uh, the, the cleaning the fiber um, and making sure it's the correct fiber type and making sure it's got the right polish because number one, you don't have to worry about damaging the internal connector because there's no internal connector to there at all. Uh, it's maintenance free because you don't have to worry about cleaning the internal connector. Again, it's not there. Um, it's versatile because you don't have to worry about creating the wrong a flat a polished, an angle polished connector to the instrument. And uh, it's dual purpose. Um, it can accept both single mode and multi mode fibers. Because uh, there's no, you know, there's no uh, mating fiber with a different core size in there. So to emphasize uh, on that, uh, you're looking at the testing single mode and multi mode fibers, which a lot of, you know, companies do, especially research universities. You may have run into cases or projects where you have single mode fibers to test, and another project, project would have multiple fibers to test. So in uh, the case where most instruments have a fiber to fiber input connection. So you may have to choose to buy one instrument. Obviously, it's just very expensive. You buy two, one with single mode fiber and one with multiple fiber. You may have to make that choice and just to buy one of the two. Um, if that's the case, you specify one with, uh, let's say, multiple fiber and, uh, or single mode fiber, it may be you're using that more commonly, and you're testing a multi-mode signal, you're connecting that to the input of the instrument as a nine micron single mode fiber. As you can see, there's a lot of light that's going to be blocked. The core size is so different that the light's going to be, it's not going to be transmitted into the instrument. So in some cases, uh, actually the manufacturers of uh, some of our competing manufacturers will specify a 14 dB penalty uh, due to this core mismatch. Um, on the other hand, if you say, oh, I'll just buy a multi-mode uh, uh, instrument and I'll feed a single mode fiber in there and it will capture all the light. But in that case, that really makes a lot of sacrifice in the optical performance uh, when you do that, um, the, the light signal just gets 
uh, goes from a single mole into a multi-mole fiber and gets dispersed uh, considerably and, and you're not getting the same performance in the specifications when you do that with a single mole fiber to a multi-mole fiber instrument. So, um, right, so our unique free space design that uh, we offer, as you can see from the previous slide and here, doesn't have that issue at all. Don't have to worry about that fiber mismatch. There's no fiber there. Um, there is a uh, concern with that is the free space input is designed with a input slit for a single mode fiber. So that input slit is there to block out any stray light. So with a single mode fiber, you have a numerical aperture of 0.1 typically. So that basically just means that the cone of light going into Exiting that fiber into free space is got a narrower cone than if you use a multi mode fiber. So the cone size being larger is going to get blocked. Some of that light is going to get blocked by this input slit that's there to prevent stray light. But we have uh, introduced a, a very novel solution to this issue, um, which will improve the dy dynamic range and stability testing by introducing an NA adapter. So I should back up and emphasize, this is the signal or the issue when you have a multiple fiber and the cone is, or the NA is 0.2, so your cone is much larger, getting blocked, some of it getting blocked by the uh, uh, input slit. Uh, with this uh, NA adapter, which is a very small device, looks like an inline attenuator, this basically will uh, reduce the cone size of a multi-mode fiber to be virtually the same as a single mode fiber. So pretty much all of the light gets passed through the uh, input slit. So of course, from that sense, you're getting all your powers uh, you're getting into the instrument. And this is a patented design that we offer. Um, so this is showing you the effect of you know, what happens if you have a different uh, NA numerical aperture uh, that uh, uh, has a different angle into the instrument, so you will get some uh, error if you don't use any adapter. It's not as significant as connecting it from a single mode to a multi mode fiber, but there is an you know, effect based on this uh, chart uh, on level error differences. Um, the difference or the benefits of that any adapter is, of course, you get much higher dynamic range by being able to basically send or receive more light from your fiber because it's reducing that cone into a through that slit. So you're getting about five dB of gain through there. Um, the next thing is it actually improves level stability with this any adapter as well. So you should not be uh, seeing the uh, fluctuations in the direct output of the unit. That's uh, due to the uh, uh, changes in the uh, uh, modes uh, of the fiber uh, uh, from the multi mode fiber, the uh, power is uh, has a speckle effect on the motor interfer interference and it's not being blocked by that uh, input slit. Uh, so, with the adapter, you get more stability due to that. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's very important to consider when you're looking at the optical interface of your instrument. Um, number nine is op operational interface. Of course, we all want to have a very user friendly device. Um, our, all our OSAs have a most driven GUI. You can just point and click the screen buttons, and anything you see on the screen, you can click on that and select the menu. Um, but it also has the same button menu as the previous generation OSAs from uh, Ando or Yokogawa. Um, we have remote control features, Ethernet, GPID, so you know, all the standard uh, uh, lab view drivers are available, um, have remote viewer software for the uh, Controlling instruments, as you can see here, you can control it remotely from a PC. Basically, it'd be like a virtual instrument from your desk. Um, last item, number 10, is the long-term reliability and support for the uh, company as well as the instrument. So as I mentioned earlier, we're a 100-year-old company, or uh, over a century-year century old company. So there's, of course, a lot of stability and longevity with our brand, as well as a very st stable uh, revenue and uh, worldwide support network for the instrument so versus new, newer companies that are coming online that may or may not be around 
Uh, we've been around for you know, 100 years as a company, and we've actually been, been making OSAs for over 35 years, as you can see through this kind of like a timeline history of the different models that we've offered over the years, uh, starting from 1980 is the first and the OSA. And uh, just over the past uh, 10 or 11 years, we actually introduced uh, 10 new models of OSAs summarized here with different wavelengths, different performance, different uh, uh, um, classifications. So we're definitely in the OSA business for the long term.